Peace. It's time for the award-winning Shake, Rattle, and Troll. A show for the serious fishermen as well as the novice looking for tips from the pros. Shake, Rattle, and Troll brought to you by Bill Loot, Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, and Ram. I-17 and Camelback Road since 1927. Yeah, we got the power, we got the speed, we're running wide open on a midsummer breeze. Fresh water, soft water, watch out, boys. Fast Daddy Don's gonna make some noise. Me and the boys gonna shake, rattle, and your host, saltwater fisherman, the man that fears no fish, Bass Daddy and Tournament Pro, Don McDowell. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm Don McDowell. Welcome to Shake, Rattle, and Troll today. You know, you missed NASCAR last night, John. I know. You know, all I can tell you is uh, Jeff Gordon was wiping up the rear. Keselowski had that Miller Lite car just turned up, man. Flying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he won like you know, 380 laps out of 400. The kid was just on fire. I tell you what, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Uh, <clears throat> here's what we're doing. We're going to be talking to JK about the nuances of having a milk tag. <laughs> <clears throat> That's right. Before you say it, yes, I will. I'll be the first to admit I don't have one. But congratulations on that. Uh, we'll be talking to uh, Captain Bill on the uh, motorsport vessel Malahini. Uh, Vern will join us uh, for a little backstory on the VA. A lot, a lot of stuff uh, very disturbing uh, coming out of VA still. This week, uh, roll call, we uh, will honor two soldiers that fell in battle uh, last week uh, for us. Um, about the 8 o'clock hour, we'll be talking to Billy Egan, tournament director for WON US Open. On Lake Mead, followed up by a local angler, best jig fisherman that I know, uh, Murray White, up there fishing on the pro side. And then we're going to follow that up with uh, James Guggenauer, our master rod builder from Rim Country Custom Rods on the Rim Country Fishing Report on the Mother Lake and lakes up north. Wonderful place up north. Yeah, you know it is. You know, I'm, I'm curious to see how many geese have landed at uh, Green Valley uh park there on the pond i swear they should put a permit in for those if nothing well, else trapping them they remove we got, got got years ago got into uh lake dardanelle and they have a resident i'm not going to call it a flock it's a herd mm-hmm. of geese and they're such a nuisance uh they do what geese do best they just yep poop all over everything and really make themselves <clears throat> a nuisance. slick Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know they don't care whether they do it on your bass boat, on the dock. You know, I mean, it just, oh man. They're very territorial, by the way. They are. Uh, they will. They will chase you down and and uh, pinch you. I seem to recall sending one of my sons to try and feed one, and him. I have images of him running away as this thing's flapping its wings, wanting more of the bread that he was <laughs> yeah. out of the bread. Yeah, <laughs> big trouble. Well, the interesting part back there, you know, there's seasonal uh, hunting opportunities, but year-round at Dardanelle, there's random shotgun fire. Can't imagine why. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm just saying. So, anyway, uh, that's what we're up to. Uh, fishing over on the uh, left coast is still really, really, really good. Um, Any skipjacks? Well, J.K., that's what's, uh, you know, that's my nervous button on that. Uh, the three-quarter day boats on Friday, we'll talk about that, and then we'll we'll talk about what happened uh, on uh, yesterday. 113 anglers were out on the three-quarter day charter boats, uh, which of four of them were out. Uh, they had a total of 48 yellowfin, 19 Dorado, 212 yellowtail, 10 skipjack, 67 bonita, 3 barracuda, and halibut, oh, which yeah. is about nah, roughly 3.2 fish per stick. And on the three-quarter day boat, that just that just slamming. Um, That's a little bit of everything, too. A li- little bit, yeah. <clears throat> the halibut, somebody was fishing on the bottom. It had um, to be. I, I don't have any numbers on the uh, half-day boats. The uh, day and a half boat had uh, actually there was two boats, 52 anglers, 168 yellowfin tuna, uh, no yellowtail, 
80 Dorado, which is all good, and that's 4.77 fish per stick. Per stick, and then uh, the day boats, and, and here's where it gets really, really scary. Uh, there was six boats out, 135 anglers, 235 yellowfin, 28 Dorado, 290 yellowtail, 70 skipjack. Oh, yeah. Shades of things to come. Yep, yep, big numbers on, uh, you know, they, they could mess around, but, you know, once we, once we break a hunter skipjack, uh, you know, for the day boats. Yellowfin are gone. Uh, yeah, it, it's time to, you know, if you haven't gone and you want to go, you need to get it done because it's, it's going to come. And it's interesting. It just, just doesn't decline. It goes it, way it quick. It stops. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I don't know how much the, uh, weather had to, had to play with it uh, you know they did you know they were getting bumps and they're gonna get a whole lot more bumps this week too it looks like yeah that's that's the the bad part you know it, 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 historically around here you know we get uh you know a day or two before dove season we get a massive storm and the white wings uh give up their amnesty and fly south and you know those kinds of things so we're going to try to get the uh, grandsons out late this afternoon if the weather holds and uh, uh, do a little... Uh, Gray skies, best to shoot from, too. Blastingly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love doing that. Yep, absolutely. Anyway, um, a lot of stuff going on with the commission department. Uh, uh, yesterday, the uh, meeting, they passed the uh, new fishing regulations. We'll get that posted on the website uh, by Monday. The... Uh, did they do the uh, tag recover tag surrender? Uh, that was that was done uh, about a week plus ago on a teleconference call. Apparently, uh, yeah. So finally, the state of Arizona is going to have the ability for somebody in cases of dire, cir- well, in not even dire circumstances where they just physically can't hunt for whatever reason to turn their tag in. They're losing the money that they paid for that tag, but they still maintain their bonus point structure, correct? They get their bonus point back, yes. <clears throat> and as I understand it, there is the opportunity to designate how you want that tag to be used. In other words... It can be donated to military, it can be donated to your child, it can be donated to somebody like Eddie Corona's OE for All. Or it goes back into rotation for the next available uh, participant. Oh, would I love to be that person in line for that particular unit? So, um, yeah, I'm I'm glad to see it. Um, there was a lot of controversy over that, obviously. Uh, you know, like most things. You know, it would be interesting to see somebody, for instance, who put in for an early season bull tag rifle was not drawn. Her second choice was for, say, a cow tag which they were drawn for, and then they were next in line for the bull tag, so they would have to resurrender their cow tag. I, I don't know how that would work. I'm serious. That's that's an interesting thought process, too. You know, how Where did they rank in terms of that? They're going to have to keep a strategic number so that everybody who was drawn or not drawn is in the same sequencing. They know that. I'm sure they have that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a matter of uh, electronic data in their... Uh we don't even want to know that computer system, do we? I still think it's a, it's a Jack Houston's cowboy hat. <laughs> Put him in. Yeah. Pull him up. And, and, uh, well, there'd be that big enough with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, yeah. That'd fit. God love him. He did have a big head. Yes, he did. Know? Yeah. Nice hat. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, that, that was good news uh, also. And then, uh, you know, uh, Chief Cantrell has been... Uh, Working on converting uh, bubbling ponds, uh, a portion of it to warm water fisheries. Uh, the let you know, me guess, he's going to do gizzard shad growth. Oh yeah, yeah. We're we're, we're going to grow uh, largemouth bass, Florida strain. It makes sense. Uh, catfish and some of those other things, uh, the department can buy cheaper than than what it costs to uh, raise them. Raise them themselves. So. Uh, that's all good news. We'll have all that posted up on the uh, ShakeRattleAndTroll.com uh, website under the uh, Arizona Game and Fish uh, page. You know, they actually have their own page there. It's Game and Fish. Uh, AZGFD has probably one of the oldest 
websites because you can you can search and search and search. It'll take you a while. Archival structure that they have for retrieval of information when you put in a search engine on that. Sometimes it's a little weird what pops up. I know, but I, I use it a lot in, in my quest for information on some of the things that we're working on. And, uh, um, you know, we've talked to uh, Scott Lamb. I hope they save that, the the bulk of it, because there there's a lot of crucial information. And, and uh, <clears throat> just like at the AZSFWC, we get boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of files. Yep. And about the time you archive them, that's one thing. But when you take the archive, clean that out. Yeah. And it goes to the recycle bin. We go, hey, what where's you that? Where's yeah. that thing we had back? Oh, we just oh, tossed that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So that's not a good thing. But, uh, well, you know, what, one of the things I do want to bring up, uh, Bill of Chrysler Jeep Dodge since 1927 on IE17 in West Camelback is having some super prices on uh, new and used. The uh, new trucks are headed out. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Why yep. don't they let me test ride one about a week and a half from today? Yeah, put two or three thousand miles on it. No, 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 no. I, I with... guarantee it'd be under five hundred and would have Arizona pinstriping. Oh yeah, oh, and it would probably have a big bull elk in the back end. Yeah, I'd be down at the principal's <clears throat> office again. Again, yeah. Yep. But anyway, if you uh, you're in the need for a newer used uh, vehicle, I seventeen to West Camelback Road, they've got your ride. Also, sell tires. Do you know that? I remember this. Yeah, for what you're riding or pulling. All right, hey, we're going to uh, thank some of our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to pick JK's mind, which probably won't take too long, on how do you prepare for an uh, archery elk hunt. We'll be right back. Firebird. All right, we're back. Uh, I hate to do this to, to you guys. Uh, you know, my loyal listeners and, and certainly myself, but J.K., how are you preparing for your elk hunt, my friend? You know, the biggest thing was is to do some preseason scouting. And fortunately, it's in you know a unit that I'm very, very familiar with. I mean, I've been up in that unit for almost 30 years now. And pretty much knowing that what the weather patterns have been, where the, you know, how much water is up there, they've gotten dumped fairly regularly. And 4A gets a lot. So I know pretty much in the preseason scouting that... You know, the bulls are all there. They've done all their velvet shedding. Should yeah. be fairly moist up there. Yeah, by, by it is. Now. Yeah, they're, and it's tremendously green. So they're going to be dispersed, which is really, really good because you don't. One of the things I hate more than anything else is, you know, waterhole fights where people are trying <laughs> yeah. to set up and it, it's uh, like who is there yeah. first and whose blind is that. The other thing is, is the, you know, physical conditioning throughout the last three months trying to get ready for the hunt. Make sure you're in decent shape to do all the things that you want to do. I mean, there's nothing worse than looking up that last hill and going, I can't get there, and, you know, the elk are right on the other side. Uh, for those people who have the tags, you know, if archery particularly, practice, 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 and then preparation of all the things that you might possibly need. And I always say take more than you need because you can just put it back in the garage or back in a oh, storage yeah. area when you're done. Yeah. But God help you if you're up there and you need something and you don't have it. You know, that's the worst thing. Well, I think one of the... Uh TV shows, albeit I'm not <clears throat> really in favor of the format, it, it's interesting to watch Naked and Afraid. They put a naked woman and a naked man out in the jungle. I mean, some really bad terrain, and you get one one item. Mine would be a Swiss Army knife. Uh, well, most of the guys opt for a knife. The girls opt for either a fire-starting device or a pot to boil water in. Wow. And those that bring the pot haven't thought far enough on how are you how do you make the pot? <laughs> okay, not gonna go there. Yeah, I'm just saying. I, I'm waiting for somebody to go. Yeah, I'm taking my hiking boots. Yeah. Well, that was the other thing too. Is is I looked through every piece of gear that my son and I are both going to be wearing. Both my sons are going to be there. So it's. You know, how many sets of camo do you have? Do you have your rain gear? Because I mean, we get those monsoons blow through there most of the time still in this time of the season. Yeah, 2.30 in the afternoon. Yeah, you get drenched, <laughs> and you don't want to be that way. Um, all the Yesterday, I, t I went to Fry's, and I bought two packages of RIT, R-I-T, uh, dye. And I looked at some of my older camo, and I thought, you know what? This is really faded. 
So I put in a dark green, and it came out gorgeous. I mean, really? Yeah. You know, take your old camo. You and know, do that. Uh, Matt Camel over here does a hell of a job uh, using um, concrete dye. Really? Oh yeah, for uh, acid staining. He comes up with just some. That's just true. I, really, I wore one of your shirts. Really kick butt camo uh, patterns. Yeah, the Tough Mudder shirt looked really, really one, good. One of a kind. Yeah. Uh, you know, years ago we did, uh, you know, before we had all the really cool uh, camo patterns, uh, real tree and, all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, that goes back to the, wow, back to the 80s, uh, black and white Polaroid camera out in the bushes uh, trying different camo patterns. Yeah, and, see what worked and what didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And the conclusion that I made was black. Just black. Flat black. Yeah. No breakup? Not necessarily. Well, in, in the desert, that's kind of an issue, but hunting up in the uh, Ponderosa Pine Forest, uh, you stand next to a tree, you squat down next to a tree. You, oh, look, look, you know what? You're, you're black, correct, black, too. Black, black, black. When I had a tag in 2004 where the Rodeo Cheddar Sky Fire went through, yeah. everybody could have worn black because it was so scorched still from those fires. That if you stood next to any tree, you blended in perfectly. Yeah. yeah, because there, there was so much down timber and so much that was still left standing. That was the reason they closed the forest for that period of time. There was a five-year closure. You couldn't camp overnight because all it would take was just certain patterns of weather, and you would hear snap and then boom, oh, yeah. snap, boom. Yeah. They had probably, I, I sat in the forest one afternoon. When I had one, my one tag up there, archery, the year after 2005, and I just heard tree after tree after tree going down because we were in a heavy windstorm. And one of those times, they started doing what they called the domino effect. It just boom, 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 boom. It sounded like the hillside was coming down. That's why they didn't want people camping there at Yikes. night. Hmm. So, yeah, you com- if you combine all the things that you need, the clothing, you know, and that's essential that you have that. Food is something that you, I mean, you can always run into town if you want to or a restaurant or something like that when you need to break away. We're staying far enough away. We're in a dead cell zone. But you want to make sure that you've got batteries and all the things that you need. You just go through a litany of all the things that will make it critical for you. And, you know, I've done all of those things. I've got a range finder. We've got the optics. We've got the equipment. We've got spares. We've got extras. I mean, you know, there's, it's going to be a big load going up. But it's well worth it because if you need it, it's there. How long are you uh, planning to bivouac? We're going to get up to the ranch on, uh, I think, when Tuesday night, early Wednesday, one of those two. If we get up there Tuesday night, we're going to hunt Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And Sunday night, we're coming back. Well, we will do the same thing we did last year. We'll get a uh, bag of onions and some uh, potatoes and just make You know, what? that's the other thing. I'm going to bring you back the liver this time. Last time it was, you know, as as long as it took those guys to oh. find me again, you know, that was a that was four and a half hours that they couldn't find me because their GPS went bad. Tainted liver is a bad thing. You don't want to do that, no. no. But I, if we get one this time, I, and, you know, that's a whole lot of eating off those livers. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, so what's your plan? You're going to start on the plateaus, uh, ridges, canyons. One of the things I've watched in 4A, which is really, we're going to be hunting close to Leonard Canyon. And Leonard Canyon's just huge. I know Leonard, <clears throat> yeah. And what I'm thinking, there's one of two places, one of which I know there was a burn that went through about three or four years ago. And I, I know the patterning. Those, those animals haven't changed in 30 years. You know, they graze high up on the elevations, and then they head back to the canyons and the draws. <clears throat> what we're going to do is ambush them on the way in or out, one of the two. You know, make sure you know where they go down, where they bed. And I know pretty much where we're going to be starting at, and we'll see what the patterns are after that. And then we may head up towards the high end of the desert over towards the Owaka Ranch area because I like juniper hunting. I mean, it's real close. You know, all of a sudden they're there. Um, you can, they can be 20 feet from you. You won't see them. Oh, I know. I, I recall <clears throat> up on the, uh, on the south end of, uh, 6A playing, playing peekaboo with a, with mm-hmm. a three point elk for about a day and a half, never to get a shot at him. But yeah. I mean, we were within spitting distance. Yeah. I mean, they're, the PJs are that thick up there. Yeah. Fortunately, they've done some clear cutting. And the other thing we're going to do this year, I have, uh, uh, I call her Sally Cow. You know, it's one of those two dimensional cow elks. Uh, I'm going to haul that up. And they're fairly easy to rip up and put down. Wait a minute. You're taking a blow up doll elk honey? It's not two dimensional, not three. 
Okay. Two dimensional. The two dimensional calico will look good. But that, if you call a bull and he happens to see that figure, that silhouette and the picture of her, um, they usually come in on a rope. Wouldn't that uh, can categorically be baiting? No, it's not. It's luring. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference there. This is legal. Those aren't. That's food food you can't do. Taking advantage of male <clears throat> mentality. And we do it all it's the time. It's universal. Come on. Yeah. All of us. We know their weakness. Yep. Same weakness we have. Elk on a pole. Yep. <laughs> Come on, boys. <laughs> time to get them. <clears throat> oh. Yeah, well, let's not go down that road. No, we can't. <clears throat> so we're looking forward to it. It's um, If the weather... I, w- I personally like crummy weather during the hunt yeah because as soon as there's a break they're just screaming all over the place yeah. and even during the you know during some of the if it's not a torrential downpour they're out there just rolling and screaming i've seen over the last two weekends i've seen a lot of animals and the bulls are already rank they're they're nasty they've been rolling in the mud they're just you know nasty. They're, they're feeling it wow well, that's going to be interesting. Uh, well, as 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 last year or last time, whatever it was, uh, you need help, make the call. Oh, you'll hear from me if we need it. Yeah. Believe me, I've got my wood cutting <coughs> permit and my uh, off road vehicle, let's say, and a chainsaw, so we can. Yeah, my son said he's not passing up any three hundred inch bulls like I did. Good man. <laughs> All righty, we're going to stand out, thank our sponsors, and we will be back. A fact which they hotly deny. Of course they deny it, cause this is the diet. You feel like you think picnics, and I see a large mouth up under that ball. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, we're gonna uh, put a call out to uh, Captain Bill, uh, uh, motor vessel Malahini. Malahini, do you copy? SRT. Over. Yes, sir. I'm here loud and clear. Okay, how you doing, my captain? What's happening, brother? Oh, not much. You know, fishing for the most part. Uh, honestly, it's been slow for the past couple of days. You know, Monday we had a decent day, and uh seems like all this uh, yellow fin has balled up, and it's kelp-orientated now. Really? Yeah, it's, that's not a good thing. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, there's a lot of boats that missed this week. You know, well, but, you know the the you know last time I was out there and you guys were out there a hell of a lot more than I am. The uh, kelp patterns were kind of uh, scarce. Has has any more uh, broken loose due to the uh, water turbulence th- with the storm blowing through there? You know, I, I would imagine that would be the case. But you know, we're fishing. We're fishing. We actually past couple weeks we've been fishing uh, southwest, and it seemed like that spread of tuna that was out in that area. Went down, disappeared, whatever you want to call it. So we're we're out, you know, hunting around. Uh, yesterday, uh, we got out. Uh, I'm not sure what we caught because I wasn't on the boat. I'm kind of under the weather. You know, sinuses and crap going. Oh uh, yeah. Heat and all well, that let crap. let me give you a clue of what uh, the four the four boats uh, that were on the three quarter day log, 113 anglers. At 48 yellowfin, 19 Dorado, 212 yellowtail, 10 skip jacks, uh, half a boatload of bonita, a couple of barracudas, and somebody was dragging something on the bottom and caught a halibut. Ah, uh, somebody's fishing local, and that's what's happening there. Yeah. And uh, it's, 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 it's transition time, you know, for, for the most part. Uh, typically about this time of the year, you see the skip jack moving in. They are. Uh, Friday, uh, the one day, uh, boats had 70 skipjack. Yesterday's dock on the one day, uh, on, for five boats was 179, uh, skippies. Yeah. I'm not going to say it's coming to an end because of that hurricane. Because of that hurricane that was pushing up from the south and the southwest coming toward us. But it looks like it's bent out. Hopefully it pushed another wave of fish up this direction. You know, like I said, I'm not saying it's over, but I hear the fat lady singing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I hear you, and I'm hoping. So <laughs> we, we've got a lot of stuff over here. We're starting our uh, hunting season and doing some other conservation projects and, you know, just trying to get, get caught up uh, before fall starts. Uh, we've got yeah. very, very, very heavy uh, October, November uh 
a hunting schedule, which isn't a bad thing, but it precludes doing some other things. And uh, you being a businessman yourself, you understand uh, during the week you got to get it while it's there because winter's coming. Exactly, exactly. You know, but there's there's a positive note to this also. The islands are still producing, you know, 50 to 60 yellowtail, nice quality size yellowtail, too. And uh, we might, uh, as of next Friday, be going back to the islands, which is a good thing for us, I think. Wow. Is that a you long know? run to the islands or not? Uh, no. No. I didn't think so. It's a, it's one sandwich and two beers. Oh. Yeah, it's 13 miles from, from the point. And, you know, there's a lot of structure over there. So we're, we're going to go back, I do believe, Friday. We'll see what happens this, this, you know, this past, this next four days and make our determination off that. If stuff starts to produce again, like I said, the hurricane pushes up, uh, another wave of yellow and we'll be out there on it. If not, we'll go back to the islands. You know, and that's, that's a good thing about three quarter day. You know, we have an option. Yeah, it sounds all good. <laughs> Hey, we're going to wish you a good day. Uh, we're getting a uh, broken up transmission, so we'll uh, we'll be in touch with you next week, Captain Bill. All right, Don, do that. Love you guys. Right. Talk to you guys later. Have yep. a great day. Be you safe. Care, hope, you, hope you feel better. Uh, Captain Bill on the Malahini. Check them out at hmlanding.com. Uh, Talk to Rick in the tackle shop. Book a trip. They're still there. Um, what well, you know, while we're on the subject, uh, the Saturday count for yesterday, uh, nine <clears throat> six. Uh, let's see. We had two three quarter day boats out, 33 times two, 66 anglers. We had six yellowtail, a Dorado, one. 123 yellowtail, two skipjack. Uh, somebody, again, somebody's dragging the bottom. They scooped up five sculpin and, uh, uh, 49 bonitas. Uh, bonitas are like little, little firecracker bullets that are, Fun to catch. Oh yeah, they're like forty mile hour fish, but uh, you know they don't. They don't. We, we've tried to to boil them. We've baked them. We've fried them. We've barbecued them, and they they don't even make good tacos. They're just uh, nasty, bloody fish. But maybe somebody likes them. <clears throat> uh, the one day boats. I actually we, we don't have a, a day and a half uh, dock count for uh, Saturday, but the uh, one day dock count was uh, five boats out, one hundred two. Anglers aboard those five vessels, 305 yellowfin, 40 dorado, 140 yellowtail, 179 skipjack. Oh. oh. Ended up being... Uh, That's a lot of fish, in, per in, in, Including the skipjack, uh, 6.5 uh, fish per fishermen so that's uh there's a lot of reeling time going yeah on. it's pretty good numbers but you know even even if you take the uh, 179 uh, skipjack out of there you know you you know that it's still a lot those, it's still are, those are good good anything over three yeah you've had a hell of a good time yeah <clears throat> yeah because you, you know you knuckle down and uh the uh sea adventure uh 80 that we went on uh we you know i did uh you know, a lot of guys were handling their own fish, which which normally I don't like to do. I don't want to take away from my fishing time, but you know, a fish would hit the deck and and uh, kick the hook out of its mouth and take it down to your uh, back around the fantail where the where the uh, fish hold is. Take your tag out. Now I think I was number fourteen, and uh, take the tag and put five staples in its uh, gill plate and. Uh, throw it in the bucket and then so that's how you know that's your fish yeah yeah the procedure is when when you sign on uh you have to go check in at the landing and and make sure you have your permit some include some don't uh you have to have a uh, california permit mexican Mexican permit permit. about 43 or 47 dollars whatever it is and then uh you go down the dock find your boat um go in in the wheelhouse there is a Let's call it a bill of lading. It was a charter list. Everybody's uh, got in place got in a line. slot. Yeah, you sign in, name, address, um, any special conditions, special <laughs> medications, uh, that kind of thing. Did yeah. you have a lot, list long enough for your medication list? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The problem with the medication, I, you know, it keeps getting stuck in my nose. I hate those pills. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so. 
Anyway, they they know all about you, and uh, you 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 get a number, you know whatever line you sign in. Uh, if you're number three, that's fine. That number three stays with you through uh, all all the way through the feeding process. You go in and you order breakfast. It's number three. You get a beer. It's number three. You get a candy bar, snack. It's number three. You catch a fish. It's number three. It's always number three. And then you just run a little total on each number yeah. at and, the end and, of the day. And in my case, it's always good to know what, what number your son and uh, your brother is. So when you oh, go yeah. and you get that beer, you go, that's number what's your, number 12. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on who's paying the tab. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it. Uh, I can just see it. You, the three of you between your son, you, and your brother, each one of you has a number. All of you know it. And I'll bet you it balanced out because all of you charged the other ones. Yeah, you know, it worked out. It, it's a good, it's a Mac thing. Yeah, I, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, we're getting the guys uh, prepared uh, for the deer season. We got just a couple of minutes here. Um, yeah, we got the youth camp coming up. Got the youth camp. Um, Do you know we're giving away a pair of binoculars, Vortex binoculars, at that thing for kid? That's wrong. Yeah, I mean, where was this when we were growing up? Never happened. We're going to have food. We're going to have help. We're going to talk to them where. We're going to glass for them, and then we're going to give away prizes. And the location is? Well, it's about 5.2 miles south of the 260 on the road to Young, and that's where we're going to be. Oh, heck, the, I can get Big Sexy up there. Yes, you could. Big Sexy would be wonderful to have up there. Yeah. I mean, that. You know, we can camp in that thing. Hell, we could have a bonfire in the back of it. No, Still no, work. no, no, no. We got some fresh paint back there. Oh, yeah. I, I was pretty disgusted yesterday. I went out, uh, talked to Joy over at Lookout Mountain, and was going to head over there. So it was a good excuse to get Big Sexy out and uh, go for a drive. Hadn't been out for three or four weeks. And uh, I'll tell you what, we'll we'll have a whole draw of kids coming around Big Sexy. There's no doubt about that. Oh yeah, we can we can do a hayride, man. Oh. But, Long story short, I went out there, flipped the switch, and it went click, 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 click. Oh. And the age-old question uh, popped into my head. What in the hell do you do with a five-ton in a confined space that you can't get jumper cables to? Oh. It was a long afternoon. Oh, about that. There, there's four batteries in that truck. Yeah, which one did you charge up to? All four, four of them. at the same yeah. time? Yeah. Oh, no, you have to do one at a time. It was a long afternoon. So. <sighs> All righty, then. Having said that, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk to Burn Bagley on the backstory, see what he has discovered that the VA is not doing, and what they're doing to our veterans. I'm Don McDowell. JK. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, we're back. Uh, joining us, uh, as always, uh, former Lieutenant Vernon Bagley, affectionately known as LT, CEO <laughs> of the Military Family Foundation and Project We Remember. Vern, how's the weather up there in uh, Rimrock? Weather is cooling down and is, you know, I'm just loving it. Absolutely loving it. Good. You're getting a lot of water? A lot of water. A lot of water. We're supposed to get a lot of water over the weekend. I think you are too, aren't you? It's sporadic. Yeah. Yeah. So, some of the neighborhoods are getting drenched. Uh, we haven't uh, had more than a couple of sprinkles, but that's not a bad thing. Yeah. All right. So, what's up on the backstory on uh, VA this week? Well, well, on the VA, the VA seems to be um, still covering. Uh, covering their tracks and staying out of the limelight, uh, making some inferences that progress is being made but not getting very specific. In other words, just enough to keep the current media off their backs. And um, hopefully, like I said last week, uh, they're hoping that they can sweep this thing under the rug and Get done what they can do and move on. Well, do you find fault with the uh, mainstream drive-by media letting this thing go? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 it's it's just it has uh, at this point in their mind become not a real story. Uh, the story has been released. The uh, 
Uh, the shock value has subsided, and now it's on to other things. And that's the purpose behind what you and I do on Sunday and, and I do on the, the other uh, on the website with the backstory is to try to keep all of this top of mind awareness. These are extremely important issues that if we don't do this, it will it will fade away and it will mean that uh, hey, we had some good people stand up, do some things, get in a lot of trouble. And the veteran didn't benefit. Well, Vern, let me ask you this: Is there, uh, you know, initially there was talk of a congressional oversight uh, committee to uh, delve, delve into this? Is that actually taking place, or is that just lip service? Well, as we become has... accustomed to coming off the hill, <laughs> uh, you know, again, I'm I'm rather jaundiced about that, and I, you know, I think it's a real lip service issue. They received their uh, inspector general's report, and they seem to be a little bit satisfied, quite satisfied, if I could change that a little bit, with the, uh, they've accomplished their task. And now they're going to review that IG report. They'll probably have a few more meetings and make, make some specific inquiries. But, you know, unless... This is going to go one of two ways, Don. It's either going to go like everything else in the past, like the big Gazi issue, like you know anything that that has you know captured the news. It's either going to just kind of fade away, or if the people of the United States stand up and remind every politician we want this to be resolved, then then maybe something, maybe. Something more substantial will result. Well, you know, the, the the only issue I have with that, Vern, is is the more we uh, try to engage our politicians, the less uh, they do engage. I, I think they become more disengaged with with the process. Uh, oh, and you know, and, in in that, years past, was very very supportive of Senator McCain. I believe he has forgotten who he is, where he came from, what he's been through. And every time we send a, a specific question, and, and we're very pointed at our question, we get a standard form letter back that has nothing to do with anything that we wanted to discuss. Well, and that's and that is so typical of all of of our political figures. So well, I've kind of changed gears a little bit this year, Don. I'm trying to. Uh, the, the governor's race. I am trying to, in the state of Arizona, I am trying to, tr- I'm trying that avenue. Because, you know, we've got to remember that these are the state of Arizona veterans as well as the other 49 states that we're talking about. Well, the way that governor race is going, it looks like we're going to get another repeat of sweeping Cold Stone Creamery under the rug. That's pretty much, pretty much it. And it, it, but it still doesn't mean, you know, again, we have one or two choices as, as, you know, citizens of this country. We can either just shrug our shoulders and say the hell, excuse me, the heck with it and let it die, the death, death we know it'll die, or we can at least attempt to get people to pay attention to what is happening to these veterans. There has been a rumor uh, being circulated around uh, uh, private trying to uh, uh, dismantle VA and privatize the the Veterans Administration. Have you heard anything on that? I have heard that, and uh, I don't believe it will happen, number one. And the reason I don't is because that hierarchy has been in existence for too long. Sure. Number two, once you start getting through the real numbers, can you imagine there's 20 million veterans living today in the United States, and of that, a certain smaller percentage are using that facility. Can you imagine unleashing that group on the private sector? Yeah, I just turned over. No, I turned over to Donald Trump. You don't do your job, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, you have the private sector, 
that is we have doctors and and uh, specialists who are leaving that the, the medical field because of Obamacare, because of the way Medicare and Medicaid has been reducing their payments. And we have those who are leaving. We have those who are opting not to attend medical school. Now, where are all of these people going to come from? Well, on all top of that, you have a movement in Hawaii trying to secede from the union. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so you've got, and, and you know, we have the group that's perpetually down in Texas is wanting to do that. Well, let, we, let, let me ask you a hypothetical question. If Hawaii sure. were to secede from the union, would that make Obama a, a foreigner at that point? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Uh, uh, I knew you were going to do that. Officially, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, yeah, I mean, just something to think about. Uh, yeah, it's just you know, it's something you can smile about. All righty. Well, you you keep fighting, fight. Uh, we'll uh, keep fighting our fights and trying to get the uh, the public engaged in this. Uh, my my only problem with with doing that is uh, as we've learned with all of the issues that we fight here uh, between John myself and the constituency, the conservation groups, the department, the commission, a lot of disconnected people out there, Vern. Oh, it's a tremendous amount, and and somehow, Dan, through your wisdom, the wisdom of your guests, your audience, someone's got it has in their mind a thought, a process that can say, this time we can do it. Vern, if, if you would uh, join us for roll call for September 7th, uh, we have lost two soldiers in battle. Uh, John, if you would. Sergeant Christopher W. Mullally died August 22nd, 2014, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. He's 26 years old of Eureka, California, assigned to the 1st Battalion, 3rd Cavalry Regiment, 1st Cavalry Division out of Fort Hood, Texas. He died in, died in Gardez, Afghanistan, as a result of a non-combat-related incident. Army Specialist Brian K. Arsenault died September the 4th, 2014, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom, 28 years old, out of Northboro, uh, Massachusetts. The Specialist was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 504th Par- Parachute Infantry Regiment, 1st Brigade Combat Team of the 82nd Airborne Division out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He died September 4th in Ghazni, uh, Afghanistan, of injuries caused by small arms fire. Guys, uh, we lost two soldiers, had their tickets punched for your freedom. As always, our thoughts and prayers go out to them, their families, and their units. That was the price for last week. Vern, thank you for your service. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, take care. Sweat and blood Hide my veil a tear In so Say a prayer for me We are back. JK's in the house. Uh, welcome to the second hour of Shake, Rattle, and Troll. If you just joined us, uh, we've been uh, talking a little bit about the Saltwater side of life, uh, fishing's you know, still blowing up over there out of San Diego. Uh, a lot, a lot of good, good fish being caught. And we're going to kind of change gears right now and go to uh, freshwater. Freshwater, yeah, one of the bigger events in the Southwest. WON Bass U.S. Open on Lake Mead, and we have with us now, as we always do, Tournament Director Billy Egan on the on the stage. What's happening, brother Billy? Good morning, guys. How are you? You know, we're having too much fun. Uh, wishing we were up there at Lake Mead. You guys have some uh, pretty good weather uh, outlook uh, for this event. You know, it's uh, in years past, we've seen uh, temperatures up to 110. Looks like you have some 90-degree uh, temperature coming in, and we, we just hope and pray there's not a lot of uh, wind and weather associated with it. Yeah, well, uh, that's kind of the, the beauty and the... The, the magistry of the U.S. Open here at Lake Mead is you never know what you're going to get. Um, it's a uh, beautifully big lake with fish that are spread out all over the place. And, 
you know, Mother Nature always seems to rear her head at least a little <laughs> bit during the U.S. Open. At least uh, once. Yeah, if she didn't, it wouldn't be the Open. But, uh, you know, uh, the guy's been chatting a little bit about the weather uh, system that is pushing up from the, you know, Mexican uh, waters down there. And, you know, they're ready to go fishing. we got uh, 168 guys that uh, signed up for this event. Wow. And, uh uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll have 168 to uh, launch. We've got some guys that have some uh, motor issues, obviously, with the low water level. Uh, we've already replaced, I think, four lower units on uh, boats out here, uh, thanks to uh, Mark Nicoletti's help from Mercury. Uh, Mercury's always out here supporting our events with uh, Mark uh, at every one of them to make sure the guys stay on the water. Well, they, but, do, a, they uh, do a hell of a job, uh, you know, coming out of the Mercury camp. Yeah, they do, and we actually have uh, Angus Green, uh, Rick Grover, sending his mechanic out, so we'll have two mechanics out for this uh, event. Uh, the weather shouldn't be too bad. It, it seems like it'll be somewhere around 90, 95 degrees maybe, um, which was very typical for last year's U.S. Open. Uh, we're no longer doing the U.S. Open in July because uh, 120 degree heat is not real fun. That's a, that's a and, good move. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we're real, real pleased with this year's, uh, U.S. Open. Uh, this is my fifth U.S. Open that I've uh, been running now, and fortunately, every year since I've started, the number's been going up every year, and, uh, we, you know, in, I think the first time in 15 years, I actually have a full field of over 150 anglers, which is a really good sign for the fishing, uh, industry out here. Well, didn't you have to, let, let, let me backtrack, uh, I thought there was a 150 boat limit. Did you get a, uh, special haul pass to increase? Well, we actually, uh, last year we had 142. This year, uh, we actually have 168 that, uh, entered. We, uh, had spoken with the, uh, Nevada Parks and Rec, uh, regarding our numbers and, uh, with the low water level, uh, and the requirements that they put on us for our permit, uh, we all decided that, uh, 170 would be a good number, cool. uh, to, uh, to get to this year. We didn't get there. We were too shy of 170, but, you know, 150 is the, uh, full field, uh, payout structure that we have for the U.S. Open, and we surpassed that. Well, we being, to, being the anglers happen. that we are, you know, if you catch a six pounder, it come, it becomes eight. So we're going to call 168 boats 170. So you got sure. it. Sure. Okay. Nice. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> what, but, uh, what, yeah. what, what have you seen as far as, um, the pre fishing? Uh, are the guys doing well? Are they struggling? Uh, we're going to follow this interview up with, uh, one of our local boys, Murray White. Um, Murray's got some expectations, and uh, we wish him well. Yeah, um, I've been hearing, you know, it's the typical. It's, it's uh, A lot of guys are saying it's tough. Um, a lot of guys are saying uh, that they're, they're finding them. Um, but, you know, it all comes around on tournament day, what what the conditions are and what the fish are really doing. Mm-hmm. Because pre-fish is, to me, it's just another day of fishing because it's never the same the next day. Oh, never, never, never. no. That, that that's what that's we have here. here in the west and that makes lake uh lake mead probably uh one of the most interesting lakes to fish because that that thing will change every every two to four hours yep the fish migrate they uh they chase after the bait one one minute they're there the next minute they're not but uh you know that Probably. that's the beauty of the u.s open that's what makes it uh as tough as it is and you know some people say it's the iditarod of bass fishing out here <laughs> um <laughs> We've yeah. got uh, we've got some new talent that came out this year from the uh, FLW Elite. Um, Scott Canterbury, Luke Clausen's coming out. Um, Jay Ellis, uh, Jim Moya, and uh, I had a chance to have dinner with those guys last night, and it was really neat sitting with a couple guys that had never been to Lake Mead before, but yet have fished just about everywhere there is to fish. Well, you know, you mentioned Luke; he, he's a pretty good angler, but you know what? I think school is in session for that young man. Oh, well, for all of them. I mean, they've never seen as much mountains, uh, you know, level changes, because they're all from, you know, Minnesota and uh, back there where there's, it's flat. And to see, you know, God's country here, and uh, to one of them had mentioned it's like fishing on the moon. 
<laughs> that, uh, yeah, that's a good. Much. That's a good analogy. It is. Yep. So uh, for them, it's you know the big horde sheep and uh, just the miles and miles and miles of untu- untouched shoreline is just uh, you know it's neat to hear these guys that have never been here uh, what their take is on it and how tough it actually is in their mind. Well, their idea of fishing deep's uh, eight feet. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, that's we're, true. They're going to be introduced to uh, you know a, a, a new mark on their meter that's like thirty-five. 45. Seriously, yeah. looking at him? Yeah, yeah, look how far they're down there. <laughs> yeah. What's a ledge? What's a ledge? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that that's pretty cool. Uh, when, when do you guys uh, kick off? What's your schedule? I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. What's your uh, schedule? Uh, today they're off the water. Uh, you pull the trigger yeah, on it. Today they're off the water. Uh, today is the uh, sponsor's row day and registration day. Uh, basically, uh, the anglers are relaxing, getting some of their gear ready. Um, uh, those that didn't register yesterday will come through and register today between 10 and 2 o'clock. When, when, and uh, did you have pairing yesterday? I thought that was Saturday night. No, pairing is tonight at 6 o'clock. Oh, boy. Oh, we find out yeah. tonight. We find out tonight who's fishing with who, and then uh, we'll be starting first thing in the morning, uh, early, obviously, uh, to get all these guys on the water and get them launched about six o'clock. Uh, first flight will be due in at two o'clock at Colville Bay, and we'll be weighing the guys in tomorrow and for the next three days with the same schedule. But the beauty of it is for all you guys at home, if you log on to. Uh, www.wanbass.com you'll be able to watch the entire tournament live on webcast sponsored by uh, Costa. Um, they're, for the third year, they've stepped up and uh, this event is, is brought to you live in its entirety uh, on, the, on the website. So you can watch the guys weigh in. You can uh, watch uh, today, actually, at uh, the meeting. We'll go live at 6 o'clock tonight. So you guys can uh, tune in and kind of get a feel for how things are. And, and uh, a lot of people have uh, really said it's enjoyable to be able to see what's going on uh, at the Open, feel like they're here. And, and uh, obviously getting it out there is, uh, is help the numbers. So we, we couldn't be happier about it, and uh, we look forward to a great event. Well, Billy, our, our congratulations to you. Uh, you're doing a good job. It's difficult to... Uh be up on stage uh, for that long, but you're doing a good job. You 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 become the Monty Hall of bass fishing, let's say. <laughs> well, let's see if my voice will hold out through the uh, entire tournament. Usually, last day it uh, gets pretty disparative, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Put a put a here. Here's a little tip: put a spoonful of honey in a uh, about eight ounces of water. Just sip it. You got it. All right, brother. Billy Egan, All tournament right, director for WON, uh, kicking off tomorrow with the uh, legendary U.S. Open on Lake Mead. We're going to stand down, take a break, and when we come back, uh, I think we'll just torment JK. <laughs> because oh, <laughs> How's that's that right. different. You have an elk tag. Actually, we're going to be talking to uh, uh, my good friend Murray White, uh, fishing on the pro side. Representing Arizona at the U.S. Open. We'll be back. Yeah, man, there's some hard-hitting Murray music. Brother Murray White, what's happening, my friend? Mr. Don McDowell, how the heck are you? Well, I'm I'm okay, but I'd rather be up there with you guys slugging it out. And, uh, you know, we're, we're... uh, not that I want you to have any pressure, but, you know, we, we mentioned that you're probably, uh, without a doubt, one of the finest jig fishermen to come out of Arizona. They, you did say that. Uh, I did. I, and and I, I watched him do it. You know? <laughs> I try. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, I've seen Murray catch jigs, jig fish where fish just ought not be, period. That You know, and that's, that's what I really like to do, and I, I think I've got that kind of dialed in here as well. Well, um, yeah, you know, I, it, Mark Townsend, I think, said it best. There's only five fish up there, and you only need five bites. But that's a big right. lake, finding five fish. Yeah, it, mm. it, you know, it, it's like finding that needle in a haystack. And, you know, I had a couple really good days of pre-fish and a couple days where I just eliminated a ton of water. So, you know, it's uh, the lake's way down. Uh, water temps are up. 
um, with this storm rolling in, hopefully it kind of stirs it up a little and we uh, can put something a little better together than what we've got. But uh, I'm actually feeling really confident. I've got a few areas that are real close in the lower basin, and then I've got my primary area that's going to be quite a, quite a run every day. So, Yeah, don't give any secrets away today. No. Uh, I'm not really worried about it. Well, <laughs> one, one, one thing on Mead, you know, you're you have the ability to make some extremely, extremely long runs. Yeah, and you know, it, making those runs, it's you know, you're losing quite a bit of valuable fishing time, and you just got to make sure you, you know, you adapt quickly, and you know, get those fish in the boat. What what are you finding? Uh, you know, with with these major tournaments, there's always a lot of dock talk and a lot of smack and a lot of head games going on. Uh, that's you know that's part of the game, and you know I, I'm one of the culprits. I do the same too. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, I've got I've got guys coming up to my boat, and I, I put absolutely nothing out on my boat that I use during the tournament. So they come up and look at all this, and they're like, oh wow, he's doing that. Okay, and, you know, misinformation is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and you know the guys that are on them because they're the ones that don't talk. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, we've got some pretty good guys. You know, we got Clifford Perch, we got John Murray, we got Josh Bertrand, Scott Canterbury from the, uh, FLW tours is going to be here. Um, you know, this is a, this is going to be a loaded tournament. It's, it's going to be fun. Well, you're going up against, uh, and, and and we're including you in this, the best of the best. And you've got a lot of big name anglers that are coming out of the east. Uh, we just talked to Billy Egan and uh, uh, Luke Clausen's up there. And, and yeah, Luke's here. Yeah, Jay Ellis is here. Um, Jay Jay could be a threat, uh, but the guys I'm I'm really going to be watching are you know the big new young guns like Luke. He's never fished out here before. He's not used to this. Well, you know, Luke, Luke is from Washington, so he does know how to fish the West Coast, and he's you know he's, uh, uh, he's a really good finesse fisherman, and uh, that can play a big role in this, you know, this week. So, how's uh, Clifford's temperature? Uh, uh, you know, other than being really quiet, um, you know, uh, every morning we'd get up, he would still his truck and boat would still be in a parking lot while. You know, everybody's gone, and he's still here. So he's obviously got something, and he's going out late, and he's uh, checking on his fish. So, I, you know, I have yet to see him out on the water, so he's obviously not fishing the same pattern I am or the same area I am. Um, you know, I ran into him briefly yesterday, you know, down the hallway, said hello, and that was about it. So Interesting. You know, he's uh, two second places in the past two years and a win not that, too long ago. That, yeah, that may be his little little head trip game right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, and, you know, even Aaron Martin is another one that, you know, should do well here, but, you know, regularly does it. So it's, you know, this lake can really make or break an angler. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to be. Uh, Rooting for you. Uh, who who else are from Arizona up there? Uh, have you run, bumped into Donnie McBride? Uh, you know, I have not seen him yet. Um, you know, we've uh, of course we've got John Murray up here, um, Josh Bertrand, uh, Zach Holleranda. Uh, you know, there's a few guys here that we know. Um, there, you know, it, it, there's so many names I could rattle them off, and you know, Matt Sure, Johnny Johnson, they're all here. So yeah, boy. But, you know, and I hate to say it, but I saw Johnny burn a hell of a fish the other day. <laughs> he caught a seven pounder in pre fish. Yeah, scratch that off your list. <laughs> I know that's the, that's the game changing fish right there, and you don't want to hit that in practice. No. Well, it's going to be interesting how this all plays out. Uh, you get in a situation, uh, you know, like most of us do. If you need anything, give us a call. We'll uh, courier it up to you if you can't find it. You are the man, Don. Well, other than that, you know, I'm just going to go out, fish hard, and play the game. 
Okay, we'll be watching the uh, pairing meeting. I thought the pairing meeting for some reason was last night, but uh, according to Billy, you guys are going to get paired up uh, six o'clock. Uh, yeah, evening. we've got the we've got the sponsor showcase from two to four, um, where we get all our goodies, and then we uh, come back down and at six o'clock do the pairings, and uh, they're going to have some good draw prizes too. I heard. So. Well, we'll be watching for uh, Bill. Really has uh, donated and sponsored the. Uh, sportsmanship uh trophy that uh, he initiated uh, uh several years ago i'm going to be anxious to see uh, how that plays out uh, uh from from really air uh bill's not up there this year the first time in uh man first time I'm in, in a long time but uh, he'll be right. back up there next year but you know bill bill's one of those guys that uh Sportsmanship is is a big issue, uh, especially on these uh, big treacherous lakes. He had a had a guy. I think he wasted a half a day taking his angler that had uh, beginning a heat stroke. Had to take him and uh, get medic attention, and then uh, you know helping some guy pull his boat in, and you know giving up his own fishing time to help out a fellow angler. And uh, Bill's had our uh, sportsmanship uh, uh, award. Uh, from shake rattle and troll and it's uh that's a big deal i mean you know you know that that's that's pretty awesome and yeah it is you know being you being a good sportsman out on this lake is uh you know that that's huge you know you someone's gonna need help somewhere along the line you know there it's a big lake it's gonna beat up some boats and people are gonna need rides well i i don't want to get you know melodramatic but you know a lot of that stuff when when the weather rolls in and you have the heat the wind the the uh high waves and uh, uh terrible water can you get you're in life and death situations oh but, absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah well murray we're gonna kick you loose god love you man uh, keep I your head down it. keep it in the game fish hard man you got it brother and hopefully we bring it back to arizona we're counting on you Murray White, right. ladies and gentlemen, wish him well. You can check him, check them out on uh, wonbass.com. Click on the um, U.S. Open uh, tag there, and you can see all the stuff going on. You know, I prefer hunting because I don't have to compete that way, and I don't have to hide stuff and just go out and do. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot to be said about that. You know, but the yeah, that, that's part of the attraction. You know, it, oh, I, I mean, it's a competitive <clears throat> deal as well as a skill factor that you have to do. We used to go so far as you know would would cut off whatever we had on, tie something else on that we never used. But anymore, you just tuck your rods in the rod locker and yeah, I grab yeah. my bow and it's like I'm out of here, guys. See yeah, ya, bingo. Yeah, it's it's you know dark thirty, time to get moving. Well, what you know, the pros understand this, but you get you know a lot of the co anglers and the wannabe guys. Uh, you know, John Murray in uh, always has been extremely open. He'll tell you where he went, what he was throwing, and how he caught his fish. And you think you're onto something, but you can't go catch somebody else's fish because by the time you get there, conditions have changed. They're not going to eat that. They're going to eat something different. And it's a process of elimination. Uh, it's a process of being adaptable. Uh, it's a process of being versatile, having the ability to change up right in the middle of a, you know, situation where you, yeah, the, the thing is, you go into these things, you've got five stops, you only have to catch five fish a day. You think that'd be pretty simple? That's a, it's, no, no, no. That's I, that a, I know. That's I've done enough task. of that. Yeah. And uh, you know, a lot of anglers and, and are so hard headed that they're going to stay with. Whatever they've got in their mind, it might be a fluke. In my case, it's top water and a fluke, uh, and you need to be doing something else. And we you have need, a real you, hard you time need to go that. to drop shot. You yeah. know, there, there's going to be a lot of drop shot fish caught up here. Trust me, the bigger fish, my guess, are going to come on on top water. I'm just saying. I know. Yeah, uh, this is this this is a shootout, man. This is a big, 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 big shootout with a lot of snakes in the bag. Alrighty, hey, I'm Don McDowell here with my buddy uh, J.K., the co-host of uh, Shake, Rattle, and Troll. For how long now? Three weeks. <laughs> Two and a half years. You wanted to come down one time. Well, I know. Yeah. Wow. Welcome. My bad. <laughs> no. Glad to have you. you All right. Uh, 
When we come back, we're going to talk to uh, James Guggenauer, see what's shaking up in the Payson uh, area and on the uh, Mother Lake. But the Rim Country Fishing Report. We'll be right back. Well, the morning's kind of damp. I'm not worried about cutting the grass. Left my truck at the boat ramp and my boat is full of gas. My old boss thinks I'm sick today. He won't have me to harass. Cause I'm out here on the river. river. And you, you can, can kiss, kiss my big old bass. bass. Kiss my bass. I'm going fishing. That only means one thing. Brother James Guggenauer, the master rod builder in downtown Payson, but room country custom rods. Whether elk are always bugling in his backyard, oh, the yeah. weather is oh, always yeah. nice. What can I say? I mean, what, James, what's happening? Hey, good morning, Don. How are you doing? You know, we're, uh, we're having a good day, James. Uh, fishing's good. Hunting season's here. Uh, more coming on. The elk are bugling. The fish are biting. The elk are juggling every day up here, and uh, it's fun to drive down in the morning. We get down to the end of the street there. We can usually see the bulls in the morning. So, great time of year, you're right. <laughs> They're having fun. Yep. And, you know, we're seeing that in the lake, too. Uh, one of the things that we're kind of commenting on, and we've been talking about it the last few weeks, is that the, the animals feel the transitions long before humans do. And uh, you can see the fish are more into a fall pattern, just uh, different different type of reactions than what we uh, have seen in the past. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, you know, J.K. has uh, been in preparation for an elk hunt, and um, we, we wish him well on that. And, uh, you know, his reports and the photographs and the videos that he's been uh, able to capture in the, in the past couple of weeks were just uh Man, that's what we live for. Yep, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good time of year for everybody. Well, we just talked to Billy Egan um, on the U.S. Open up at Mead. They've got 168 boats, uh, which is more than a full field. Uh, you were right; they they had to expand it from the 150. Murray White's up there with Clifford and John Murray and a bunch of our local guys, and uh, they're going up against some of the, the best national fishermen that we have, so it's going to be interesting. Are you hearing anything uh, out of Clifford or John or anybody? Um, haven't heard. Uh, talk with Matt Shura, and uh, he's been up there pre-fishing for about a week, and he said it's been a pretty tough bite. But uh, he's finding some uh, sporadic uh, good fish. Uh, Clifford said uh, that it's uh, been uh, pretty good. He didn't say excellent, but he said pretty good pre-fishing so far. Well, he's got a pretty soft demeanor at the lake. Yeah, you're right. Pretty, you know, he, uh, pretty yeah, he's, he's, he's quiet. And, and Murray even uh, commented on that. He says, man, we're up and gone, and, and Clifford's boat's still at the hotel parking lot. And, uh yeah, he's yeah just he just snoozing. says hi, goodbye, and nothing. So. Yep, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> hmm. Hey, a couple updates on Rosemount uh, that I can give you. Okay. Uh, uh, first, let me start with the water level because this is good news. Uh, we remained at 38% full. That's the third week in a row that it stayed right at 38. So basically we're seeing a little bit of slowing in the water being taken out for down uh, in the valley use. And then we've seen some good monsoons that are, you know, get into the watershed and eventually end up down in the lake. So it's kind of been a wash for the last uh, month or so. So uh, that's good news. The salt is flowing at about 85% of its normal rate, and the tonneau is not flowing. So uh, I know we're supposed to get some more storms this week, and uh, that would be great. Anything that we can get into the lake is going to be good. Uh, we were talking about things changing in the lake, and the temperature of the lake is also changing. In the mornings, we're in the low 80s, and it's kind of been that way for a while. But in the afternoon now, we're, we're saying mid to high 80s. So we're starting to see a cool down in the lake. And it's, um, you know, that's part of the reason that the shad start to school up at this time of year. And uh, so we can already uh, see those changes happening. Fishing on Roosevelt and Apache. I talked to guys who were down at Apache last week, 
and they're reporting it to be good to very good. And, uh, mm. you know, we've been talking about a lot of shad in both uh, Roosevelt and, and Apache for, for the summer. And as they start to school up and we start seeing bass chase those shad up into the shallows, guys are calling bait balls enormous. And when you get local guys that are surprised by the size of the shad ball, uh, you know there's a lot of bait in the water, a lot of activity going on. Uh, that makes for some great pop water bites when they're when they're busting the surface like that. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, and Don, one of your uh, sponsors here, Rio Rico, was number one top water bait that I heard mentioned this uh, week. Did, uh, they, did they happen to say what uh, pattern? Yeah, they're using a shad colored uh, uh, Rio Rico. Mm-hmm. Now, with the with the tail on it, so uh, so they're using the larger one and and just ripping them. They said in the in the backs of coves is where they're kind of pushing them up, and it's kind of steady. They said they'll they'll bust for about ten minutes, and then it kind of slows down for yeah. about five minutes, and then yeah. they'll come up there and, and corner and back there again. That would be a feeding wolf pack, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, that's where we're that's where we're moving to. Yeah, I suggest real hard looking at that uh, holographic shad, uh, the big one, uh, like you're talking about the rear Rico instead of the Rico. Mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. bam. Right, right. Um, the other thing I was I was going to say is that uh, guys are saying once the the shad bite uh, slows down a little bit, they're moving back out to that twenty to thirty feet of water. And doing their drop shot or their Carolina rig, but the the difference is with we've been talking about translucent colored baits, like a lot of people are familiar with the morning dawn. Mm-hmm. Type now I'm hearing more of things like a camo colored bait or a, a camo pattern in a black and silver color. Uh, what, these are what, what, any discussion on that Salt River Craw color? Um. Didn't hear that this week, okay. but we've definitely been, been hearing that uh, in the past. But the guys I talked to this week were actually going with smaller baits later in the day. This is now a uh, smaller bait in a uh, robo worm and in those camo patterns, mostly in the green and sometimes in the black and silver. Uh, the other good fishing down there is in, in the crappie, you know, is as the weather gets more stable, we move away from the monsoons. A uh, crappie will start to school up more, but they're always going to be in those brush. And uh, a lot of our experienced crappie anglers are saying you need to go find three or four brush piles that you can rotate during the day. And, uh, you know, they'll vertically fish in those uh, brush piles and maybe catch one or two crappie out of it and move to another one. Let that one kind of soak for a little bit and then you can come back to it in a half hour 45 minutes later and catch a couple more yeah the parallel i would draw to crappie fishing it's like hunting ra- uh cottontail rabbits yeah exactly that's a good parallel hmm. uh, but they seem for whatever reason to be skittish like that uh, one or two and in move and one and two so and, and the good news is if you find one of those brush piles you can almost just troll down the bank like if you were going from uh, around the, the dam area heading up towards Choya, if you go along that uh, shoreline and you find some birds brush, chances are if you move 50 yards up the shoreline and find another brush, they're going to be there too. Mm-hmm. So that's the way guys are kind of targeting along that shoreline to find uh, areas where crappie are. Yeah, that's a great tactic. Fishing a 2-inch grub tail on a 1 16th or 1 8th ounce jig head uh, those have been working uh, really well the last couple of weeks, and I'm starting and this. Another sign that it's kind of getting towards fall is that they're starting to tip their jigs with a live minnow, and uh, so that a lot of a lot of the crappie anglers are using that during the day. Now, to, when is it? Tomorrow, I guess we have a full moon, so there'll be a lot of crappie anglers out there at night fishing with live minnows for for crappie. <laughs> ah, that's all good. Oh yeah, fun time, fun time. Good. This is the time the guys start to get excited again about uh, about fishing. Uh, you know, 
if they're not talking about uh, uh, bass fishing or crappie fishing or trout fishing on the rim, they're talking about elk or deer hunting. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. D- don't forget turkey and deer. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Uh, I know the uh, we got about a minute to get this thing wrapped up. I know uh, the Game and Fish has uh, curtailed their uh, rim country lake stocking. Uh, is the fishing still holding up? Excellent. You know, uh, after Labor Day, we always say that the crowds kind of go away and you can do a lot of good fishing up on the rim. There's still a ton of trout in those lakes. So this is a great opportunity. Guys, if you like the fall or if you're up scouting uh, for something, <clears throat> Uh, go take the afternoon and, and uh, hit some of the rim lakes up there. I guarantee you, you take a, a young uh, family member up there, and you'll have a great time. Well, I, you know, there's a little twinkle in J.K.'s eye. You know, they're going to be up there on an elk hunt, and uh, my best guess is he's going to take his uh, rim country rod up there. and uh, For a christening. It, absolutely. You know, you do the morning hunt. Yep. Yeah, noon, little noon, little fish. noon fishing, afternoon hunt. It's only yeah. about a 10-mile ride in from where we're camped to the lake. That's what I'm talking about right there. Hey, and J.K., you'll enjoy this. One of the baits that I heard that's working well on the rim this, this past week is your road runner. Really? Really. And I'm... drive wide in a cicada imitation. Cicada imitation. Wow, it's a big Yeah, we're fly. gonna have to come up with something for JK. Uh we'll build him a woolly Prius for something like that. Oh thanks. All right. <laughs> All right, James. God love you, man. Hey, we'll talk to you next week. Uh check him out, rimcountrycustomrods.com. We'll be right back. Got up at dawn just to be out on the water. Weather man said hot and getting hotter, but he didn't say nothing about it. Rain like hell. All righty, we're back. Oh, oh man, you gotta love that. Love that. that that's a good song, Jennifer. Be honest. Thank you, Jeff. That's kind of where we are today, you know. You know, Chet Reynolds does a good job here at KFNX on the on the weather. The difference between him and the other weather guys, he looks out the window to see what it's doing before yep. he gives you the weather report. Yep. The only nice thing, job. The only thing I can hope for is that we do have rain this week. I really, really, oh, really, I really think, want I it. think that's a given. Uh, you know, we've got a couple things uh, planned for uh, this week. Uh, we've got to run up and check some trail cams and see where the bear is, see if he's still there. Have you got those up? Ooh. Yep. I so, want to see I want to see photos. You've got to do that. Yeah, we'll see what's going on up there and uh starting to think about turkey season. Uh maybe this afternoon we'll get the grand grandsons out. Uh I've got a new new uh little four ten for uh Max. How get, old's Max? Max is eight, I think. Eight or nine. You can handle the four ten. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Well, as male mentality runs in my family, I hate to admit this, he had to shoot one of the heavier shotguns. Of course. Had to. Get knocked over. Yeah, yeah. Gave him a weapon, and he's been kind of leery ever since then. So Can't imagine why. Instead of giving him a 20, we'll give him the 410 and then ease him into the 20, mm-hmm. uh, ease him into the 16. Then Ma- the Mason's already, uh, at his size and weight, uh, is already shooting a 12. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he handles a 12 gauge. Uh, Mason's an animal. Quite well. Uh, he, you know, I thought he was a little light for. No. The, he, he really wants to be in it. Oh, he's in it. Oh, oh yeah. Well, that, that's the big thing. This, this year we'll have, uh, myself, my son, my brother, and, uh, Mason with the deer tag. And, uh. Between the four of you, somebody better come back with some decent horses. Well, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take Max, uh, you gotta take him with you under yep. your wing. Yep, It'd be like hunting with a bell around my neck, but it'll be fun. Trying to keep him quiet is going to be the biggest. Well, task he needs have. to get the lecture, like, shh, don't step on any pine cones. Oh yeah, don't get in front of me. Stay back here. Yeah, got a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go to the bathroom? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's always the oh, big yeah. one. Like, yeah, what so, are we thinking anywhere? <laughs> so we've got the turkey thing going on the first week of October, the first week of November. We got that going on. We've got a turkey hunt. Uh, you are going to be at the deer camp the second week in October. Yeah, yeah, we'll be up there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to uh, bring Big Sexy up there and get the five ton up there. And 
that would be worth has. the price of admission for anybody who comes to the camp for those well kids. you know it's it's uh i don't have a <clears throat> atv uh so you don't need it uh, I'm just, you will create your own way <laughs> i i have my wood permit yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's your total justification, and I understand yeah, it. Everybody absolutely. does that. But, you know, the way that truck has uh, been reconfigured, it'll sleep uh, three guys real easy with that little crop top that uh, Amp Upholstery built. Um, it's got all the stuff. Got a, got, got a small generator, propane, lanterns, yeah, lights. Really. Oh, yeah. Know. Oh, by the way, I'm not about. To, I'm not supposed to give out secrets, but there are a couple of really nice, decent bucks in 23 North that I saw last weekend. Not only that, I picked up four. Well, I, I don't call them button bucks because they're 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 still involved, but their antlers were a good nine ten inches on each side. Really, really cute, and they were they're decent deer for those guys who you. 23 hunts. If you want to see a deer, and there's a bunch of them, I glassed up over seven of them. Within the first hour, and they were they some of them were within close as fifty yards from us. You're a glass and monster. Oh, I love doing that. Yeah, that is so fun. It is. Yeah, got to have good optics. But uh, one 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 last plug uh, out for uh, Joey Notch at Lookout Mountain Outdoors. He's got uh, Glenn Sheldon over there wrenching on bows, guys. Uh, Glenn's the best of the best, and uh, you know, in my opinion, and certainly Joey's opinion, the uh, best bow wrench we've ever had in the Southwest. Well, he's there at uh, Lookout Mountain Outdoors. Uh, it's about a block and a half north of uh, Bell Road on Cave Creek, uh, next door to the feed store. You look for a big horse that has, I think they put pink socks on that horse. Oh, I know. They do uh, everything. Just wrong. I still like Bridget's last laugh. Uh, it's good. It's good. Uh, and if you're coming south uh, on Cave Creek from the uh, 101, uh, the uh, candy store will be on your left-hand side there. At, uh, Joey's is on the right. Uh, Union Hills. Just go on down till you find Joey's. Uh, look out Mountain Outdoors. But, yeah, uh, they've got a uh, new line of bows. They're doing uh, rehab, rebuilding, tuning. Um, a lot of good stuff. In fact, I've got right now, I've got four, four weapons over there being, you know, professionally cleaned and looked at and tuned up and getting ready to be. You know, my son's borrowing a bow. It's set at a 68 pound draw. It's on a Matthews. So it's not a real far pullback before the cams take over. Mm -hmm. And I might just have somebody up there turn it down to about 63 for him. Yeah. Yeah. That, that'd be my guess. Uh, Pastor, I met Pastor Scott up there from Desert Breeze Community Church, who's quite quite the bow hunter, and uh, he said, I need to have my bow looked at, and uh, I met him up there, and was his fly on the wall while Glenn was lecturing, or giving the good pastor his uh, bow tech sermon. Oh, boy. And Scott walked out of there just going, Bleh. oh, yeah. And when you get somebody who's really, he said, really I had no idea. It yep. does all that. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the let off that you have once you get past a pull point, and the longer that you can hold, it's the better shot that you become. Yeah, but anyway, I, you know, I want to throw it out, out there. Uh, you know, we try to bring you the best of the best and uh, look out Mountain Outdoors. Archery, outstanding. Guns, ammo, a uh, lot, lot of uh, consignment, camping, knives, stuff. Weird stuff. It's like going to a yard sale every time you go in there because you don't know what you're going to see. Yeah, but there's always fun. That's and There's besides, always something you go, wow. You know, he should sell coffee because he, everybody would just sit around. If you sold it for five bucks a pop, he could make a lot of money just because everybody likes to sit around and listen to the stories. Like, you know, I get in so much trouble. I, you know, I'll, I'll give word. I'm going over to Lookout Mountain. Yeah, it's good for three. Nah, I just be there for 20 minutes. Yeah, well, You'll never be there 20 minutes. An hour and a half later, minutes. you know, we're, we go to Africa and shoot warthogs <laughs> and Cape Buffalo. Speaking well, of, when are you doing that? Uh, I haven't determined that yet. Uh, probably after first of the year. You know, I've got to get through this year. and Yeah, you know, that's the time of year. Saving up for air travel tags or permits. and. Yep, check the temps before you go over. I pretty much looked into it. I, you know, I don't think it's uh, going to be a big deal after, you know, it kind of mirrors what we have here. No, Pete said that when he went over, he went over in shorts and a flip flop, and he walked off, and there was snow on the ground. Uh, really? Yep. I had heard that part. In, in Botswana, he was in South Africa. I don't know where he was. They can't have. Snow I can't. I can't. Tell you. I don't know. They can't have snow in Botswana land. 
I don't know. They have pygmies. I've, I've <laughs> figured that out. I'm not real excited about that. I have no clue. And uh, the <laughs> thing that we're uh, kind of taking a look at, it, 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 it's, a, it's a consideration. It's not a concern. But that Ebola outbreak is kind of working its way. Towards that area? Yeah. And I'm not real happy about that. No, and there's nothing you can take to stop that either. If you uh, get there. I, Just stay away from the airport. Stay away. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Oh, I can't go. Take a boat. Good point. They fish over, fish back. Oh, wouldn't you have fun? Oh, my God, yeah. All righty, guys. That is it today for September 7th, Shake, Rattle, and Troll. Uh, check out the website, uh, shakerattleandtroll.com. If you've had an experience with feral hog, seen a feral hog, give me a call. We've got a uh, feral hog hotline. We're getting a lot of activity on that, by the way. I've got some news for you from uh, Richard Leitner up at the uh, Buckskin chapter of the ADA. Oh, we will talk. Hey, that's it, guys. Uh, think about the price of freedom this week. Uh, take your kids fishing, hug your bass boat. JK, we're out of here. We are.